So we're back with Alex, and he does the voice over IP thing. And then I pick him up that he basically does Wi-Fi in the subway system. I mean, it's like, it's somehow related, but that's a crazy idea. How can you get the subway system to agree to put Wi-Fi in and, and to do that in a sort of a public way and then sell it? How did that idea come about? Because I can't imagine everybody wants Wi-Fi in the subway system because it's really bad. So, yes. so tell me. So it's really a, a simple idea, right? It's just executions, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. So Ed, I'm quoting Edison. Uh, so I used the wireless uh, GSM system in, in Paris, in the metro, uh, in the 80s, late 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, like the idea that there was no connectivity in an underground system was just ridiculous. So, so Wi-Fi, uh, the, the, in Paris, in the yes. subway system, they had GSM? Yes, in the in late 80s, yes. and uh, for wireless phones. And, and in the US, so we, it, it, Transit Wireless, the company we're talking about, operates both the wireless service and the Wi-Fi. It's not just uh, the Wi-Fi, right? So we, we basically provide the service uh, as an a underlying carrier to all the users, but we provide the signal that belongs to AT&T, Verizon, or Sprint, because they basically bought these frequencies. Yeah. So when I uh, came to the US and I was using a subway every day, like the only way to communicate was a payphone that was inside the subway. I mean, it was just crazy, right? And it was noisy and it was crazy and, and so on. So, so I, um, uh, I went to the MTA and I said to them, you need to have uh, wireless. We didn't even talk about Wi-Fi. We just talked about wireless. And, uh, and they were like, no, uh, it's a bad idea. Uh, you can put bombs and activate them remotely. And I'm like, look, you don't need wireless cellular service to activate bombs. If you want to, uh, uh, any walkie-talkie can do that without any uh, special uh, connectivity. Anyway, they would not want to listen to anything that I... It was 19... This was 2001. So after, after September 11th, right, after, the, after the, the horrendous thing that happened in the city, my, my best friend actually was at the towers and he died. Hagai Shefi and he and I said, what can I do to kind of, you know, do something about it? You know, some people volunteer, some people gave money to the families. I was like, I'm gonna, you know, part of the problem that happened during September 11th was that, you know, all the trains got shut down because a lot of them actually congregate through that through those towers. A lot of the trains that were going to Brooklyn and so on were all going through there. So when the towers collapsed, there was no... And all these trains were stuck, people were stuck, there was no connectivity, nothing. Yeah. So I'm just going to focus on that. I'm just going to solve that problem, you know. And so I just kept nagging the, the MTA. Uh, so three or four years went by before they would even entertain the idea. And they wanted me to fund the survey to prove to them that most people want wireless in the subway, right? Glad, I'm sure you gladly did that. Yes. So we did the survey. I think 75% of the people said, yes, we want it. And I showed it to them. And when they, uh, when they said, when they looked at the survey, they said, great. Now we have to open it to bid. We are a nonprofit. The MTA is actually like a nonprofit organization. And we can't just award you the contract. We have to open it to bid to everybody. So 400 companies bid to provide the wireless in the subway. 400, 400 companies. Yes. Yeah, so, so you spend all this time to, uh, to push an idea and then it goes up into bid. Yeah, that's yes, the, that's the fate. 400 companies submit the bids and uh, um, they do like uh, three stage bidding. So the first time it's like 400, then it's like less than 100. And at the end, like five companies left. And one of the five, one was obviously ours, Trans Wireless, but one was a consortium of all the carriers. So AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and T-Mobile got together, created wow. a, co a company. They already saw you as a big enemy. Yes, they like, oh, this is the guy that did Voice of IP and stole all of our profits. We're not going to let him do it again. So we're going to create our own consortium. Yeah. And there's no Very way... Very smart. Yeah. yeah, there's no way the MTA is going to award Alex Mashinsky a contract when there is this company here that's owned by the four carriers. Of course, they're going to give it to the four carriers. Yeah. So the difference was that uh, they estimated it would cost like $400 million to build the system. And we estimated it would cost $200 million to build the system. Who was right in the end? So we also, we, uh, we, we had uh, my team, I mean, I had several partners there and so on. 
but my team had all the designs of how to avoid crossing the rails because when you run cables if you have to cross the rails you have to stop the, the subways and stopping the subways seven million people it's already bad imagine having to shut it down for an hour or two so um, so because we had very few rail crossings and AT&T and their uh, sophisticated, uh, I, 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 don't, I, I don't remember if they use Ericsson or somebody like that, but they used a very uh, reputable firm to design all of that. Um, they had like hundreds of rail crossing, right? We, you, we're talking about 300 uh, underground stations. You basically fought about the perspective of the subway of yes. the MTA. Exactly. So when the MTA looked at the two bids, uh, they chose us. But the funny story is that they, you would think they would call you and tell you that you won. They, they, don't, they didn't do that. Uh, I remember I was sitting at home on a Sunday and my wife... Uh, we got the, the New York Times paper and she looks at it and she throws it on my lap and, and she says, I don't know if you're the smartest guy or the dumbest guy. Look at this. And I'm like, what? And it says, you know, uh, the MTA awards uh, the contract to Transit Wireless to build the subway system. And then it says the Transit Wireless agreed to pay $46 million for the uh, contract for the fr franchise, right? It's a 25-year franchise. And it says, and then it says, the consortium of four carriers agreed to pay $4 for the same franchise. So, so I oh my paid God. by $46 million just to get started with, right? And I'm like looking at it, I'm like, no, you don't understand. It must be a mistake, okay? They probably meant 40 million. They just m mistyped. I'm going to call them Monday morning. You'll see it's all going to be fine. Four dollars. It was four dollars. But that nobody carrier. would pay. For it. Exactly. It was one dollar per carry. That's how arrogant these guys are. So arrogant. They were like, "There's no chance in the world." So we're just gonna pay the minimum possible, one dollar each. <laughs> Did you raise that two hundred fifty million? So we uh, we used a variety of system. This was so, so the award came in two thousand and six. And we actually got uh, Merrill Lynch, a subsidiary of Merrill Lynch, to fund the project for us because it was an infrastructure project and we thought everything was wonderful. And then 2008 happens, right? The collapse. And we, we went to uh, uh, Merrill Did you, Were you funded before that? Uh, we, we, the partners, put a few million dollars personally just to f fund the basics. And then as we built stages of the project, uh, Merrill Lynch was supposed to fund the, the scale. You didn't raise it in one go. You yeah, basically did it yes. in an infrastructure way. The funny thing was that we came to the subsidiary of Merrill Lynch and said, okay, give us a, a, a payment, a progress payment. Here, we built this, the first six stations, give us a progress payment. And they're like, oh, sorry, we don't exist anymore. We just sold ourselves to Bank of America. We no longer fund anything. Don't come here anymore. Goodbye. You're not welcome. So we had to go and look for funding in that year, in the worst time possible. And of course, the carriers loved it because they didn't want. You see, the the subway is like a gym membership. When when the gym sells you membership, they don't want you to use it. So when you use the subway in, every day and you don't use the wireless service, that they love that. Perfect, yeah. If you put wireless in the subway now. They have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars servicing you underground, which is obviously not a very profitable service for them. So, so they wanted to kill us every day since we came up with that crazy idea that the, that the subway should well, It's not completely true because, I mean, if you do phone calls, at first you got paid by the minute. There's, no, there was no, it's all unlimited. All it was, at that time it was already unlimited. Okay. Yes. So they don't make any extra revenues. Okay. It's, it's really a loss uh, maker. Yes, a loss so how did you survive? So we, we struggled. I mean, we were on the edge of, uh, I, I can tell you that it was a very difficult time. No one wanted to invest in this project because you come to people, you talk to them about investing and they say, okay, great. Can we call your customers and see how much they'll pay for it? And you're like, no, 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 don't call AT&T. Don't call Verizon because they would say, we will never use this service. Don't build it. So, so we were, but if you build it, they will have to use it, right? Because if one carrier is in the sub subway, all the carriers have to be in the subway. So what we needed is one carrier to break up with the rest of them and agree to be part of the system. And then Steve Jobs came to the rescue. Yes, Steve Jobs comes to the rescue. So Apple and AT&T agree 
on an exclusive launch of the original Apple iPhone. It's 2000 and I think 2009 or something like that. And AT&T launches it everywhere. And in New York, basically, the, the phone... No was, connectivity. It was yeah, horrible. Because the speeds were so low that you, you couldn't use the phone. But in the subway, you had five bars. You had only AT&T and you had five bars. So AT&T basically agreed to break up with the rest of the carriers so they could make their experience for their customers a little bit better. So just like with Voice over IP, they did it for a completely different reason. Here, they basically did it to save themselves... Uh, but they opened the Pandora box. The minute they got in, then Sprint came in, and then T-Mobile came in, and the last guys to come in. The night before we launched the service was Verizon. They were like, really? They signed the contract midnight before we launched the service. Really? So they, they, they just not came half a year later. Everybody waited, and, and did you launch all the stations together, or did you launch, uh, launch 50 stations at a time? No, no, at and had the first six stations. They had that uh, almost like exclusive for six months. And then we launch the next 20 or 30, and then we launch 50, and then we launch... Now, now it's 300 stations. How much do you charge per station per year? So we don't charge the customers anything. The no, user, I mean AT&T. Right. So the carriers pay about a million dollars per station, so the whole system is about $300 million a year in revenues. Uh, for providing the services, so they hate me a lot. Like, but it's a, it's a million total per station, yes. so it's two hundred fifty thousand or three hundred thousand yeah, per carrier, carrier, depending carrier on the traffic. Size. Exactly, okay. exactly. But okay. and a million, three hundred million, and that is for a New York size market, just underground. That's a lot of money. Yes. Why didn't they negotiate lower? I mean, because you are the, you had a monopoly. Yes. So so I built two monopolies. Arbinet was the first monopoly. And uh, uh, Transit Wireless was a second monopoly. Both are unicorns. These were two of the best companies. In the last 20 years, if you look at the biggest exits in New York, it would be the top 20 exits. It was 1.3 billion or something yes. like that? Yeah, so, yeah, I made a few, a few dollars from it, you know. Yeah, yeah so, now, so, and you also had, so you made 1.3 billion, so you sold it for 1.3 billion, but you, you didn't have 20% at that moment, right? I mean, no. uh, what was your percentage when you basically it went? Was, it was still a good percentage, you know, so. We'll leave it at that, okay. Um, what was your experience with the financial world? Uh, to raise money, to go public, uh, to do reporting, how, how did you feel about all these investment banks? which you had relationships with? So look, I mean, all these companies, the, the bankers, the VCs, the, they're there to make money for themselves. They're not really there to make a world a better place or to help humanity or, or to whatever. And, and the grocery stop shop around the corner is the same. Not exactly. I think, I think there's a lot of businesses that, that have a mission that, uh, that do things because they, they have a mission, not just because they want to make money. Wall Street is famous for doing things because they're trying to make as much money as possible. And again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that, I, look, I'm a, I'm a huge benefactor of... You are a guy who really profited from the system. You were able to make it, to put it to work. Yes, but I'm also remember where I came from, which is nothing, right? So, so we talked in the first segment, we talked about me leaving Russia, leaving the Ukraine, going to Israel. And when I when I was crossing the border to to you know to uh, to Vienna, uh, the Russian uh, uh, board uh, security guard basically took all my toys because he said these are Russian toys. You leaving Russia, you don't deserve any toys. So I had like two toys. That was my all of my possessions, right? So so I experienced the the and the same thing in Israel, right? I mean, you grow up with nothing. I mean, the the you, it's very you don't. You don't make a, uh, you know millions of dollars uh, in salary in Israel. It's uh, at least not 30 years ago. So nobody does, except if you're a CEO of a big company, exactly. like we're going to talk about. But what? But so I, I grew yeah, up with nothing. I grew up with with nothing. Like uh, being jealous that other kids had Legos, being jealous that that kids had bicycles and I didn't. Things like that, right? So. So I went from like this complete scarcity to abundance, right? To having, being able to buy anything I want. And, and, and again, money doesn't make you happy. It's not like suddenly having a lot of money makes you happy, right? What makes you happy is achieving your destiny, achieving what you're destined to do, yeah. right? And very few of us actually get to do that because most of us get stuck doing a job we don't like 
or being, you know, having to provide for family or whatever and not being able to do what we actually want to do. And I, I had that rare opportunity to actually do again and again exactly what I wanted to do. And, and that brings us to Celsius because Celsius... No, 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 we're not talking about Celsius. Now, that's the next interview. We're going to get there very soon. But I just want to know, how did you feel about dealing with those bankers? I mean, they provided you with funding and next funding and next funding. They did exit, but they also were instrumental in building your billion dollar success. How did you feel how they did business with you? I, I think the most venture capitalists I worked with are... Uh, you know, they, they, they're there to make the company successful. So I have no arguments over any, any of the guys I worked with. There's no like, oh, VCs are bad or, or they're bad people or anything like that. But actually, the, the first investor for, for Arbonet was a Dutchman, uh, oh. Roland Vandermeer. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yes. And, and, uh, uh, but the bankers are different. The bankers uh, on Wall Street, are, 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 they're like... Uh, you know, they, they have very, very different incentives, right? And they're just transaction oriented. They're not oriented at building a company. All they care about is the transaction. They, they could care less if they never work with you ever again. So, so there's very little loyalty, very little kind of camaraderie, very little, and that's all I know. I don't know. And how so it's not that if you've done an IPO with one uh, uh, banker, you go, you go see him again it's, and then say, hey, we work together, you know me, I know you, we're going to do this a great thing together. It's not that you do that. You know, definitely not. And they're, 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 there's an expression on Wall Street that says, if you, on Wall Street, if you want a friend, go get a dog. <laughs> okay. So this is the second company, 300 million sales a year. They, they, the exit was 1.6 billion or something like that, right? How is the company doing now? It's doing great. It's uh, providing service. It's earning a lot of money. And uh, I'm still a shareholder. I still have a piece of it. So I still get a dividend. So I use it every day and it's really great. I mean, if it wasn't there, it would be completely... Well, everybody the secret. So the secret is everybody's using the Wi-Fi. But if you really want exceptional service in the subway, turn off your Wi-Fi and use the five bars that you have on the 4G of because you have unlimited anyway i just want to have it during the train rides when are you going to put it uh, when it so there's already a few segments that are running uh in the in the tunnels yeah. and all the tunnels by next year all the tunnels will have uh both uh, lte and wi-fi okay. and wi-fi is for free right and, and i basically get all these bloomberg ads is that is that is there a business model for that no, it's a free service. We provide that. Uh, it's subsidized by Bloomberg in this case. Sometimes it used to be subsidized by Google. So we just have different sponsors for it. But we charge, we gave it for free to the people and we charge the carriers for the service. That's why they hate us because they have to keep paying for it for the next 25 years while 8 million New Yorkers get it for free. Okay, so we're going to the next phase and that is Celsius, a bank, a crypto bank which I have an account on, and he's want to piss off another group of people, the bankers. Let's go about that. <laughs> 